I'm here with Howard Watson, CTIO at the BT Group, to talk about the critical topics of 5G and Open RAN. So Howard, great to see you again. Um, how has BT's 5G strategy developed in the past year? Well, Ray, let me firstly say it's great to be here talking about 5G. And it's been a really busy year. I mean, first of all, for all network operators coping with you know, the population in our countries working from home, learning from home, uh, and in many cases, you know, enjoying themselves online uh, with the capabilities uh, that we provide from home and the growth in the network from that. But in parallel with that, the fact that we've also continued to roll out our 5G network and continue to add that capability, I think we are really proud of that. And if I just look at the scale we've done on that, we're now in 125 towns and cities. Uh, benchmarks uh, put us ahead uh, of our competitors in terms of 5G coverage in the UK, and that's something uh, which we take really seriously and will continue to drive. Now, clearly for us at BT, uh, we also had another significant change uh, introduced this year, which was the need to ultimately remove Huawei uh, from our network. Uh, the government uh, pronounced on that in January, but then also again in July. And so throughout this year, that's forced us to rethink our strategy. We signed new deals with Nokia and Ericsson. We're now on a program where we will uh, completely swap that network, and it's two-thirds of our network, uh, over the next seven years. But importantly, really doing that in a way which gives us another leap forward in terms of capability in the network. And I'm really pleased that we've taken that challenging need and created a great opportunity out of it. Now, 5G is still being rolled out. What will the world look like when, when 5G is really widespread? I mean, the one single word I would use for that is integrated. Uh, I mean, right now we're all focusing on enhanced mobile broadband. Uh, the opportunities is as, as we move ever towards 5G standalone networks, as opposed to the non-standalone networks we're using today, that really allows us to bring to life the uh, sort of massive device-based IoT parts of the capability and the ultra reliable low latency piece. So, you know, that will also mean that our networks will converge you know, between fixed, mobile, Wi Fi, the different technologies will come together into that really sort of integrated uh, smart network that we've talked about in the past. What kind of workloads are you expecting to see on your 5G network in the short term and then in the longer term as well? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, right now, um, it is enhanced mobile broadband. It is customers uh, getting great new devices and with those, you know, getting significant increases in speed uh, and that traffic, of course, then being carried uh, over our core networks, you know, primarily to content caches or to the internet, you know, and we have seen just significant increases. Um, I mean, I think I was looking at some data where they just took an example, the Strava exercise app gone up something like five or six fold in terms of usage uh, across mobile networks for obvious reasons with people exercising local to their homes. Uh, and we've seen a big increase in that. So I think we'll see that continue. Uh, but you know, the early work that we're seeing now in enterprise use cases, uh, you know, whether that's the work we've been doing with the Belfast ports uh, or other areas is where I think in this coming year, we'll really see that start to accelerate. So does BT plan to offer edge compute based 5G services? And if so, will they be focused towards any particular verticals? So, at, yeah, I mean, edge compute um, will certainly be offered. It will be offered both for consumer type applications uh, such as augmented and virtual reality, but also and actually probably uh, more at scale is for enterprise applications. And we see a real sweet spot opportunity between private 5G networks uh, combined with edge compute. Uh, and, you know, and I think many verticals we're looking at, ones that we're looking at right now is uh, security across, I mentioned the port before, one of the you know, security options there, uh, multiple cameras being able to store some of those images 
uh, in the edge compute devices and then process that and feedback changes to a central surveillance center. Um, but also some automation, you know, factory automation, we're working with Worcester Bosch as well uh, on how can we create smart factories, whether that be for the robots inside the factories, you know, or also for the people that are running and managing uh, the output and capabilities for those factories. So for me at the moment, it's automation and ports are a particular area, but we're still sort of spreading ourselves quite widely across the verticals. I think another one I'd mentioned uh, is drones. Uh, we see a lot of opportunity in the future uh, for the use of 5G for running uh, the traffic management of, dr of drone networks. Now, obviously important to all of these is security. Can you talk about the role of telecom operators in enhancing cybersecurity, not only to protect the networks, but also the services going to the customers? And, you know, critically vital and, and you know, right to ask that question, Ray. Um, and we at BT are well versed in this. I mean, we have 125,000 uh, cyber attacks to defend of multiple types every month. Yes, every month. Um, you know, and we've also got 3,000 people who work in security across the globe as part of our uh, global division. 5G you know, helps us in terms of new capabilities to secure the network, whether it's the user plane or the control plane. Uh, and that capability is continuing to enhance uh, and also providing capabilities at the edge of the network or on customer premises and ensuring that we get end-to-end -end security from that uh, is critically important. And I think, you know, we've seen recent incidents, um, you know, which which has sort of brought security even more um, to the fore now. The solar winds for incident, for example, uh, has increased uh, enterprises' worries and concerns about their their private networks and ensuring that we're keeping them uh, extremely secure. Now, 5G, of course, is front and mind uh, for everybody right now, but it's not the only way to access networks and services. How do you see the interplay between Wi-Fi 6 and 5G in the future, uh, particularly for enterprises and in inside buildings? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of Wi-Fi, and I do think it continues to be a bit of an unsung hero um, in the connectivity business. Um, because actually, from a, from a network techno-economics perspective, if you are not moving, i.e. you are not mobile, uh, then offloading you to Wi-Fi and, and the data being offloaded onto the fixed network, uh, where the economics still remain better, uh, both from a, a cost per bit and you know power consumed per bit, so energy per bit, uh, getting that offloaded as quickly as possible uh, is critical, and, and never more so than in buildings. So um, you know we we see a real opportunity for both 5G and Wi-Fi 6 to coexist. We welcome the fact that some of the underlying radio standards are converging as opposed to diverging, which is good. And we're working with both 3GPP and the Wi-Fi Alliance on how do we drive that forward to, to really bring more and more convergence. And let's not forget also that you know, Wi-Fi chipsets are still significantly cheaper from an end device perspective. Now, uh, in the UK, with the government pushing for RAN disaggregation, does BTC Open RAN being part of its 5G future? Yes, we do. I mean, I, I've been on the board of the Telecom Infra Project, TIP, for, uh, well, he was a founding member. I went on the board four years ago. Uh, and one of the projects we've had working in there for some time is Open RAN. And we did some uh, particular research early on about VRAN. Uh, so the opportunity of supply diversification for the long term uh, is something that we are strongly supportive of. We are strongly supportive of the, the task group that uh, the government has set up that uh, Ian Livingston is running. Um, just looking at that whole ecosystem as to how can we get more supply and diversity is critical and important. However, as ever, the key issue here is timing. Uh, and by that, I mean, you know, when the systems, the open round systems and components that make up that uh, will be able to work, you know, to the standards that we deploy today and the availability that we deploy today in the dense urban environments. That's what I'm keenly watching. 
Uh, and actually, I think, you know, given I'm doing quite a bit of network change out right now uh, for the reasons, you know, of the high risk vendor uh, and swapping that out. Um, actually, once that gets to its next replacement cycle, I think Open RAM will be, you know, absolutely ready at scale to be deployable. And what does BT see as the biggest challenges to deploying Open RAN in networks? Uh, maturity, Ray. It's you know I, th I think you know right now we really welcome uh, the trials that actually some of my peer operators are doing, uh, but mainly in rural at the moment. So you know in a, with a single carrier um, and a single radio standard, you know whether that's four G or five G. Uh, there are solutions which are deployable now. You know, what we're really keen uh, to see and to continue to stimulate is, you know, today in our macro network, we've got five carriers of 4G aggregated together with a single carrier of 5G. And that, that will continue to get ever more complex as we use our spectrum in ever more, you know, a fairly fragmented spectrum in ever more clever ways to combine that together. So seeing that development in Open RAN, uh, but also the other key piece is seeing the developments around modulation, continuing to improve the bits per hertz, uh, per gigawatt hour of energy, uh, and improving that at the front end in the modulation parts uh, is, is super critical. Now, how has the shift to 5G impacted BT in terms of its day-to-day -day operations? And has this driven changes in other parts of BT's network? Yeah, I mean, I mean clearly, as you improve the, the amount of capacity available at the edge of the network in the, in the RAN, um, you've got to make sure that there are no bottlenecks anywhere else. And the one thing that we have uh, focused really heavily on is a 10 gig backhaul. Whatever we've deployed 5G, we've deployed a 10 gigabit per second backhaul circuit. It's in often cases upgrading from the one gigabits per second that was there previously. And then as we start to transform our core network, you know, there's some really critical changes there which will enable the future capabilities uh, of 5G. And with increasing disaggregation across the network from the core right to the edge, uh, do you see BT engaging in the systems integration itself or bringing in help from external vendors or SIs? I think the actual answer there, Ray, is a mixture of the two. Um, you know, we traditionally, but also I don't think this will change in the future, have been real believers in having the deep network expertise in-house. I mean, at the heart, we are a, a, a network connectivity business today, and that requires that deep expertise. Uh, clearly, that task will be more complex in an open round world because we but you know that is the nature of the disaggregation and the diversity in the supply chain. Um, so it will be primarily in-house, um, but we'll continue to look at support from you know from a number of uh, and it's encouraging to see actually how a number of um, you know vendors and suppliers are you know starting to work in that systems integration space around Open Run. And what kind of challenges and opportunities does the introduction of a 5G core platform bring to a major operator like BT? Now that's something that we've been working on uh, for the last couple of years and clearly have another couple of years to go on that. So the first thing I would say is it is a long haul program. Um, and for us, we are replacing both 4G and 5G simultaneously. Um, and we're working very closely with Ericsson as our partner there. We've been doing lots of trials. Uh, we've now got that built. The other great opportunity, you know, when it comes to replacing the core, and it's something we don't want to do that often, um, but right now we can make it cloud native. Uh, you know, so we're moving from a virtualized infrastructure to a true uh, cloud native approach on what we're calling network cloud. Uh, that gives us real opportunity to look at how do we get to a much more agile world in terms of the ability to add new features and new capabilities, new pricing models, new flexibility and propositions. You know, we are really hoping that uh, and, and have early confidence that we'll be able to take, you know, propositions out of the marketing uh, teams and get them onto the network in really super fast, super fast speed. Uh, through the use of that great new core, as well as it enabling all of the standalone 
um, you know, low latency and large number of devices capabilities that we've also talked about. And is BT looking at any opportunities around the emerging private 5G network sector? Yeah, and I think that sector, the sort of private 5G networks, is something that we'll see some really early movement on. And I'm expecting some of that in the coming year. You know, we've already made some announcements around Belfast, Belfast Port, uh, the work we're doing with Worcester Bosch. Um, it's looking like that is going to be, I think, one of the significant use cases um, of 5G for enterprises. Uh, and I think on the back of that, you know, an opportunity there to integrate a private network with the macro network. So I think using the same spectrum so you can seamlessly um, move from public to private, but have, having the security wrap uh, around the private network um, with edge capabilities embedded in that, I think that is really the next area of development for 5G. And finally, what are you most excited about in terms of the future of communications networking? Well, that's a, that's a big, wide question. I think, in, you know, we've got all of the, you know, the great capabilities that we're building in the network now. So, you know, we're rolling out 5G uh, on top of our 4G network. Uh, and we'll ultimately use that to switch off the more legacy 3G and 2G networks. Uh, we're rolling out FTTP in the fixed network, and that will ultimately replace copper broadband. So I think the networking piece, we have the plans in place for. What's really important for all of us uh, in the telco sector is finding the new routes to revenue growth. You know, we've seen usage pretty much double uh, during the work during the lockdown periods of COVID, uh, but revenue uh, has hardly increased at all. Uh, so how we all work together, that's the technical teams, the product teams, you know, our partners uh, in the supply chain to find new sources of revenue uh, to, to move the telcos from being pure connectivity providers to be more broader service providers. That's what I'm really excited about over the next few years. Great. And let's hope that 5G can be a real driver for that. Howard, it's been great to talk to you today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ray. 